Well, I got my Losar greeting in the email this morning from the Abbey. Yeah. <laughs> huh, you didn't get Wow. You better send one to everybody. <laughs> so I've always wondered about New Year's because it, well, many, all the holidays actually, we seem to just pick them out of nowhere. They, do, they don't, well, it's the anniversary of this and that. But why? You know, why only celebrate that day? It seems like it's a, it's a way for human beings to create special days because they like special days, you know, and to eat special. I think it's like actually an excuse to, to eat a lot, you know, because <laughs> that's what you do on holidays, isn't it? You get together with your family and friends and you eat. <laughs> yeah. And. And supposedly you're celebrating different things, but it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, especially since New Year's is supposed to be, you know, identifying the day that's New Year's. It's the astronomers do it and it's supposed to be the exact day. But the Tibetan and the Chinese, as with everything else in life, don't agree on when New Year's is. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the root of the conflict. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's curious. So, uh, I, I think it might be nice if, um, I don't know if there's a BBC one of these days, but if you talk about what happens in the Tibetan community before uh, New Year's, the different pujas and the effigies and uh, everything. I think it might be quite interesting for people. Yeah. And it, explain what it means. Yeah. Because there's a lot, a lot going on now leading up to Losar. Be before you eat uh, on Losar, you have to feed the demons and everybody else. <laughs> Okay. Oh, now we're going online. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know me now, huh? <laughs> okay. So, uh, let's start with visualizing the, uh, merit field. And I think it's quite helpful in our visualization, you know be surrounded by all the sentient beings. And just remember that they all want happiness and not suffering equally. And that we want to help them attain that uh, and for many beings, um, it won't be this life, this lifetime. Yeah, that could be because of our limited capacities. But also, you know, many people are attracted to other paths or to no path. So I think one uh, quality of bodhisattvas is always maintaining an optimistic mind because you know that circumstances will change and eventually, you know, because uh, happiness and suffering depend on causes and the causes for happiness can be created and the causes for suffering can be overcome. So with that in their hearts and knowing it takes a long time, bodhisattvas are willing to spend that time benefiting sentient beings 
waiting for us to kind of wake up and realize that uh, there's something we can do to change our situation in samsara. And to help other sentient beings do that as well. So let's uh, put down our ideas about how everybody else should think and what everybody else should believe in. Because what we think, what we uh, think should be, should happen, should doesn't uh, really make any difference. But when we put down some of these shoulds, like everybody should be open to Buddhism, I want everybody to meet the Dharma, everybody should meet the Dharma. Together with our shoulds, uh, there's a lot of expectations, there's a lot of uh, who's in and who's out. And so instead of being open and accepting people as they are, we meet them with our shoulds. And that uh, usually doesn't work very well. And it's not very respectful. And yet, we want to be with people who we think think properly and have good beliefs and good values. It's difficult to accept people who have different ways of thinking. But it's uh, something that if we're going to benefit sentient beings, something we have to be able to do. Okay, so with that bodhicitta mind that is not forcing bodhicitta on anybody, <laughs> and let's share the teachings today. So in, in Buddhism, one of the ways that we develop love and compassion by the, the seven points is by thinking of uh, sentient beings being our mother, in other words, or our father, you know. But in other words, that we have known them personally and that they have been kind to us specifically, Okay. You've been kind to me as my mother and nursed me and changed my diaper and so on. Okay. The uh, equalizing, exchanging self and others, you don't have, doesn't have this thing of they've been kind to me personally. And so that's why I want to repay it in equalizing self and others. It's they've been kind to everybody basically because of what they've done in society and whatever job they have and so on. So it takes, it's, uh, 
you know, may, I don't know, for some people it might be easier without the personal relationship, and some people it might be more difficult. Yeah, but it's, it's interesting to be able to cherish people um, who you, you know, don't identify as uh, you're in your family. Yeah, because things are so organized around the family as the social unit, even though that's really kind of fractured in the in America now. But, um, you know, the idea is there. And yet, you know, you know, people, I want to benefit my family because that's a question that comes up so often uh, at the end of courses and retreats. Oh, I love this course. It was so wonderful. I want to go back and tell my family about it. You know, I want them to meet the Dharma. Especially, you know, if you're in a relationship, I want my spouse, my boyfriend, my girlfriend to meet the Dharma. You know, I want my parents to meet the Dharma because then maybe they'll be nicer to me. Um, <laughs> you know, so we, um, we have the, these kinds of things and, and we feel like it's, we're very magnanimous wanting to share the Dharma with them. Uh, and yet, Okay, there's a couple of points here. One is, if we're really concerned about uh, family and cl- close family creating merit, which is one of the, you know, we want them to meet the Dharma so they could create merit, then we should think about helping them create merit now while they're alive. Okay. What is quite interesting um, not only in Asia, but also in the West, is, um, you know, people are with their family, everything, mm-hmm, as it goes. And then when somebody dies, then all of a sudden, oh, they're dead. I'm going to create merit and dedicate it for them. Okay. They, they need merit. They're going on to the next life. They haven't created any. So I'm going to create merit and dedicate it for them. Okay. But we can't transfer merit like a bank account, you know? So our merit, the merit we create for relatives and so on creates a good atmosphere. But, you know, they're the ones who create the karma. Yeah. But, while they were alive, I didn't encourage them to create good karma. Yeah. While they were alive, you know, if they wanted to be generous, I said, uh, hold on, you know, save, save the money for the family vacation or save it for emergency in the family or, uh, you know, whatever it is, we, uh, don't sa- save, Save things for the family. Don't give them away. Don't, um, yeah. And so while people are alive, we don't encourage them to create merit. But after they die, when they can't create merit, then we think we'll create it and dedicate it for them. But it actually makes much more sense while they're alive to encourage them to create merit. Yeah. But we can't go around and say, Mom, Dad, you know, you should really create merit because you want to go to nirvana and not samsara. And so take refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. And your folks are going to say, what language are you talking? I just stare a bunch of foreign words. What in the world are you talking about? Okay, so uh, to think about, you know, how can we benefit the people that we know very well in this lifetime who are not Buddhist? Yeah, Some of, of you have families that are open to Buddhism. Not my family. <laughs> yeah, so how do you benefit them given the situation uh, that we're all in right now. So, and, and, yeah. 
And what's this thing about, yeah, they're dead, now I'll create merit and dedicate for them. You know, we, we don't dedicate for them while they're alive. We don't encourage them to create merit while they're alive. Yeah. But you could encourage them to create merit without using a lot of Sanskrit words. Just, you know, there was an earthquake in Turkey. Let's help the people there. Yeah, there's a million people that are homeless now in Turkey and Syria. One million. Yeah. The last count of the dead was 33,000. But the, yeah, because it's, I was going to say it must have gone up because I, that was from a few days ago. So 43,000. So unbelievable. You know, the amount of people influenced. So can we encourage family and friends, you know, help those people? Yeah. Cut our family vacation short one day. Or don't even cut it short one day. Don't, don't eat out at this fa fancy restaurant and give the money, <laughs> you know, to to a charity organization. I just found it quite interesting how, how we think as human beings. Yeah. Yeah, when people are alive, we're afraid of upsetting them. We don't encourage them to do virtue. Yeah. When they're die, when they're dying, when after they've died, yeah, then we do all sorts of things. Yeah. After my grandmother died, I I uh, I was in Dharamsala then, and I went up to see Genlam Rimpa, who was this really wonderful meditator, and uh, I asked him to make prayers for my grandma, and he, his response was, "You're the one with the karmic connection; you do the prayers." Oh, yeah. And I realized, yes, he's right. You know, why do we ask other people to do prayers for our relatives when we're the ones who have the karmic connection to them? Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, we kind of like, it's kind of, like, this sounds very crass, but, you know, it's like, um, yeah, it's like paying somebody to do your spiritual practice for you, or rent, rent a, uh, rent, rent some sangha, you know, <laughs> rent some sangha, pay them to create merit while you have tea, and maybe gamble. Yeah, New Year's yeah is a big time for gambling in the Tibetan community, even at the monasteries. I shouldn't say that, <laughs> but it is. I mean, because they have a two week holiday. Yeah, so um, I won't tell you anymore. <laughs> I'll leave that to Geshe-la. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this whole topic here of equalizing, exchanging self and others, in my mind, it comes into what I was just talking about. Of how do we relate to other people? Yeah. And, you know, if we exchange self and others, what are what are really we really wanting for others? Yeah. Oh, I want you to have the vacation going to five star hotels. Yeah. I exchange self and others. Yeah. So instead of going on the vacation myself, I, I want you to. Yeah. Five star hotels. So nice. Yeah. Oh, don't you think so? Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Actually, I travel a lot. I don't like staying at hotels. I'd much rather stay at people's homes. Yeah. Hotels are like... Anyway. Enough about me, even though that's my favorite topic. (laughs) Okay. So let's go back to the text. We finally finished verse 90. (laughs) After how many weeks? So we'll go on to 91. So he's still in the whole next series of, of verses. He's still on the subject of, uh, you know, equalizing self and others. And the big question underlying it is, why do I think I'm more important? Okay. And this goes along with the question of, why do I think I'm always right? Well, I don't think I'm always right. I know I'm always right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Why do, why, when my feelings are hurt, does it hurt so much more than anybody else? Why is it that no, that my trust has been betrayed by somebody I cared for and nobody else has ever felt like this? Nobody else has ever had their, their trust betrayed like this. No, how, how, Everything that happens to us is just so unique in the universe. Never happens to anybody else. The bad stuff, yeah. And yet, we're suffering from it. Yeah. And then we hear, well, you have to love yourself before you help love others. Okay, oh, finally I have an excuse. You know, forget about others. I'm going to love myself, yeah, and care about myself. And, you know, they said I should do that and that that's a way to get to the point of caring about others. So, yeah, let's just love myself. See, we don't really know what loving ourselves means or caring about ourselves means. We think it means going out shopping and getting ourselves a present. That's what somebody said to me once at a talk, you know. I'm so tired of uh, taking care of my family and this and that. You know, I'm going to go out and buy myself a present. Okay? Yeah. And then you have His Holiness say, if you want to be happy, if you want to be selfish and just take care of your own happiness, then care about others. Uh, 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 Yeah, we hear that and forget it. Because, I mean, we have such distorted ways of thinking. Because if I take care of others, then they will take advantage of me. And they will expect me, if I do something kind, they will expect me to do the same thing the next time. And I don't want anybody expecting anything out of me. I want my freedom to do what I want. Interesting, isn't it? Okay. So, verse 91. Although there are many different parts and aspects, such as the hand, as a body that is to be protected, they are one. Likewise, all the different sentient beings, in their pleasure and their pain, have a wish to be happy that is the same as mine. Okay? So, I really love this analogy, you know, with the the hand and... uh, the leg, and how one part of the body helps the rest of the body. And, uh, you know, why? Because they're part of the same organism. And yet, we are all part of the same group of sentient beings, 
but we don't automatically reach out and help others as if we were part of the same whole. You know, we see them as different, you know, unless there's a common enemy. Now, somebody uh, a few months ago said, how how are we going to unite the United States and get the people together? Who's going to do it? And I said, Putin. Yeah? Because uh, 10 years ago, what he's doing would have really united the country. Now it's like, you know, whatever we can use to separate ourselves, we do that. But before, we really saw after 9-11, my goodness, the country came together. Yeah? And, and what, because there was a common enemy. So that's something that, that brings people together. That's, that shouldn't be what really brings us together, should us? Yeah. I mean, because we should have some compassion for the quote, quote, enemy too. Yeah. I mean, I think of all the Russian kids that are in that battle and the Ukrainian kids and none of them know each other and yet they're killing each other. Yeah. You're killing people that you don't even know. I, I don't even under, I don't understand that. Anyway, with the hand and the foot, yeah, the, you, you step on uh, a rusty nail. Like if you go out to the, the, uh, work site, yeah, there's nails all over the place. So be careful. Um, I noticed that because when I was a kid, we went to see the new temple that was being constructed, and we walked around, and I stepped on a rusty nail. Yeah, so I always am careful now about these things. So anyway, you know, you step on a nail, the hand reaches down, pulls the nail out, Put some Neospore in, you know, you go to the doctor, get a, get a tetanus shot, and it's over. Okay. Yeah. The hand doesn't go, oh, foot. Stupid foot. I told you to look out where you're walking. And what do you do? You step on a nail. And you not only step on it, you expect me, you know, because I have tons of things I could be doing instead of helping you for your stupid accident. You know, I, I, I you expect me to fix it up for you. So, again, I, the great and glorious hand, will come to your aid, you stupid, foolish foot, and pull that nail out and take care of you. But don't you forget how much I'm helping you, because now you owe me a favor. Okay? There's nothing like that, is there? Yeah? The hand just does it. Also, the hand doesn't go, oh, the foot stepped on a nail. The foot is something so important, so holy. I, I should help the foot, but I, I'm just a little hand. If I go and help that foot, that is so out of context. Somebody who's really important should help the foot. If I go and do that, everybody's going to think that I'm meddling. They're going to think, you know, that I'm butting into somebody else's business, that I'm incompetent anyway. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to help the foot. I'm just going to mind my own business. Hmm? So interesting, isn't it? What goes on in our mind? All the reasons why we can't help somebody. For their benefit, we're not helping them. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody low like me helped somebody high like that, what would other people think of that very high person that they're associating with me? You know. Yeah. 
quite curious. So, you know, to really look at when we do help somebody, how do we do it? Do we have to, like, talk ourselves into it? <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I've had to really talk myself into it. Yeah. But then, even you talk yourself into it, then, you know, somehow, I'm so wonderful. Look, I gave up my maroon cashmere sweater that was so valuable. It was like pulling my heart out. But I did it. Yeah, I did it. Even though now I'm freezing, I don't have my maroon cashmere sweater. So I need a stuffed animal that I can pet that's soft like my sweater. Yeah. I, oh, you're going to get... Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. I'll, I'll pet that one. <laughs> that one that can't make up its mind if, if it's a bunny or a chick. <laughs> so... Yeah. But to, I love that example of just, you know, how the hand does it. And there's no trip about it. And there's no, what are other people going to think? What are, pe are people going to expect things of me? Are they going to think I'm out of place? Uh, you know, are they going to pay a lot of attention to me afterwards? Ooh, I like that. Are they going to pay a lot of attention to me afterwards? Ooh, I don't want that. You know, but, you know, instead of making a trip out of everything, you just do it, and it's done, and that's it, and your mind is peaceful. Mm -hmm. One time I was staying, um, and this is just an example of how uh, the afflictive mind makes its stories. Uh, I was staying at, at a house across the street from the Dharma Center, from the Dharma Center, and uh, one morning I saw one of the monks who um, was taking some of the garbage cans. Uh, they had been cleaned picked up the garbage the day before, so he was taking them up the hill where they belonged. And I thought, oh, I'll go help him. And then I thought, that monk hasn't been very nice to me in the past. Yeah, I have a whole story with him, too. I don't know if I've told you that one. Um, and if I go help him, you know, it, it's not that that... I, I have a bad relationship with him. It's, he's difficult to get along with for everybody. Yeah. You know, one of those people. Yeah. Not like us. Uh, <laughs> who are so harmonious and easy to get along with. And I thought, if I go and volunteer to help him take the garbage cans back, knowing him, He'll criticize me because my story about him was about a time when I was trying to help him. And he turned around and, you know, really got mad at me. So I better not go and help him take the garbage out. You know, garbage can up. But, you know, I want to. But I don't want to get n near him, <laughs> you know, because who knows what he's going to say to me. Yeah. And that whole thing was totally made up in my mind. Yeah, I have no idea how he uh, might have reacted. I just made up based on something that had happened halfway around the world a few decades before. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and also watched his behavior since then with other people. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so to just, when you want to do something virtuous, just do it, yeah. 
without. What are they going to think of me? Oh, dear. Okay. And without big trips, you just do it. Yeah. So here, this example that Shanti Deva gave, you know, why does the hand help the foot? Yeah, because they're part of the same organism. And I'm sure the foot helps the hand, because if the hand gets burned on the stove, the foot is going to take the hand to the doctor. Yeah. But I don't think the foot thinks about it. And I don't think the hand goes, you know, I pulled a thumb, a uh, 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 a rusty nail out of you five years ago, you better take me to the doctor right now. You know, that there isn't that. There's just a very easy, yeah, that's the word, easy, yeah, to make it easy instead of, yeah, without expecting rewards, without expecting thank yous. Yeah. Um, because the, the quote, quote, reward is just uh, in how you feel about doing something nice for somebody without saying, oh, I did something nice for somebody. Yeah but just the, the natural pleasure that comes from that. Mm -hmm. So think of, remember this example, the next time you're sitting there, God, should I help? Shouldn't I? I don't want to. I'm too busy. They won't appreciate it. They're going to expect too much from me afterwards. Yeah. The guys in, in prison that I write to, you know, when I write, uh, b because they always tell me stories about the uh, the chow line, okay? That's the big thing. You're going for your meal. You're standing in the chow line. Yeah. And some rough, tough guy comes up with his buddies behind him and wants to cut in front of you. Now, in prison, somebody cutting in front of you is a big no-no. Yeah, don't do that to anybody. Unless you're a big guy with a, some friends behind you. Okay. Which is what usually happens. Yeah. And so the guy who's in front, you know, sees this happening. The big guy doesn't even need to say peep. He doesn't even need to, you know, yeah, say, mm, that's really my place and cut in front of you. you know, it's just expected yeah, that if you don't want to get beat up and you don't want to get raped, you step back and let, let them in. Okay? And so I tried saying, um, you know, to a couple of the guys, you know, there's a way to deal with it without making yourself a, a clump of dirt groveling in, in the ground. Yeah, because that's kind of the purpose of what somebody else wants you to do is, like, oh, you're big, strong, okay, I'm afraid of you. Yeah, go ahead, you're powerful, I'm not. Yeah, that there's a way of handling it without doing that, you know, and without uh, necessarily standing up to the guy, because if you stand up to him, you're going to get beat up. Yeah, not just by him, but his guys behind him. Okay. And, and I said, just, you know, you stand there. You, if, if you're afraid and you back away and let them come in, what they are picking up on is the fear. And they want you to feel afraid because that makes them feel powerful. And because they think that they confuse fear with respect. Somebody's afraid of you, they respect you. Of course, it's not what I consider respect, but for those people, yes. And so I say, no, you just stand there 
you have your dignity, this is your place, but with your confidence and your dignity, yeah, you just step back and say, please, you can have my place. And you do it like that. Yeah, they said, you're crazy. <laughs> but I really think sometimes in those situations, yeah, that if you maintain your dignity, yeah, and you voluntarily give what the other person wants, you're going to avoid a conflict there. Hmm? Because uh, that guy will know that they can't intimidate you. And you know that, you know, my place in line doesn't really matter beans. Yeah, I'm going to get the beans <laughs> one way or another. At, at the, you know, uh, and it may be later rather than earlier. Uh. So have you ever thought about what you would do if you were in a, a, a situation where a shooting was going on? Yeah? Have you role-played it in your mind? Yeah. What are you going to do? Is there dharma in, yeah, we were told, what is it, run, hide, fight. Yeah. So is that what you think of doing? What, what's, you know, how, how are you going to handle that if that happens? Are you thinking anything dharma? Yeah. Of course, you know, role-playing how it, it, you know, what we're going to do in our mind. That doesn't mean we're actually going to do it. But, uh, it's, you know, it's like, our, our sadhanas and, and all of our other meditations where we pretend and we visualize so that one day we'll actually be able to do it and have it happen. Okay? So I was thinking about that last night, what I would do. And I was imagining if, you know, I was in a... My my first thing was, you know, being like in a classroom. Of course, I don't think I'm going to be in a classroom too many times in the future. But, you know, some small room with a group of people, maybe you're giving a talk or whatever, and somebody comes in and they have a gun. And I thought, wow, what would it be like if somebody, you know, comes in the room and we're all chanting, Om Mani Padme Om Om Mani Padme And just through the chant, you create this feeling of peace. And here's this guy coming into the room like that. Is that something that would, you know, make him stop? That would have some influence? And even if it doesn't influence him, what about me? Yeah. Or us, the people in the room. Yeah. Is it better to, to, uh, you know, hide under your desk and be terrified and cry or chant the mantra? And would I remember the mantra in that situation? Or would I just go, Bleh! You know, which is our usual response of my body. I don't want my body to get damaged and hurt. Yeah. Yes, I know I visualize giving it to other sentient beings, but not this guy and not now. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So anyway, interesting to think about how you would handle these kinds of situations. And then I thought of my friend, the cougar. Yeah. And I realized, actually, that was a very good... Uh, I'm glad that happened. Because 
My other thought was, if I'm in a situation like that, if I happen to be running, you know, from somebody, saying, because I was doing the higher grief mantra then, saying that at that time would be really good because that has a force of like, you know, repelling the harm, but not re- not hating the other sentient being while you're doing that. Okay. So it's, it's interesting to, yeah, what would I do? What would I do? I haven't really gotten to the point, you know, because I've read stories about the New York subway, and this happened uh, during when Obama was president, and what, somebody tripped and fell and was in the track of the subway. And one man, he was with his child on the, on the platform. And he just automatically ran, jumped there, pressed his body on the other person, and squished the other person down. And then the train went over both of them, and they both survived. You know? They invited him to the State of the Union address that, that Obama gave right after that. But I thought, that one, that one's harder. Yeah? That one's harder. Could I jump off the platform to save somebody else's life like that, where it's very risky and chances are, oh, I'm going to come out flat as a pancake. Uh, so, so you see, I mean, these, I think these kinds of things are useful to imagine and work with in our meditation because at some point in our practice, maybe eons from now when we're bodhisattvas, um, we're going to have to do that. Not have to do that. We're going to want to do that. We're going to want to jump in right before the subway car is coming and save somebody's life. Yeah. So, but just to imagine it now is scary. At least for me. You scared thinking about that? Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm just giving you a bunch of different situations where we can really th- think about how how can I work with my mind so that if, when that kind of thing happens, I can um, respond as a bodhisattva with a mind of compassion without any trips going on in my mind. You know, like subduing the the shooter just by them hearing the Chenrezig mantra. Wouldn't that be cool if you could do that? I mean, that mantra has power when you chant like that. There's power there. Could you actually subdue somebody? A lot of people chanting like that. Okay, 92. The suffering that I experience does not cause any harm to others, but that suffering is mine because of conceiving of myself as I. Thereby, it becomes unbearable. Isn't that true? Yeah. Because... Yeah, that suffering I experience, nobody else experiences, you know. There's countless sentient beings in this universe. Nobody else is experiencing that right now. Nobody else even knows what I'm going through right now. I'm suffering all alone and nobody else knows, and nobody else cares. 
And it's all because I'm conceiving of a real I. Yeah? Wow. How often do you think like that when something's not going the way you want? No, they did this, they did that. Or, I hurt so much, why aren't you paying attention to me and trying to help me? Yeah? You should be a good Buddhist, and I'm suffering. Help me. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's all just because we're conceiving I, and then everything that happens to me becomes totally unbearable. Yeah, every small thing. Yeah. No? Yes. Yeah. Think about the small things you get irritated at about almost every day. Do you get irritated about something every day? Maybe not flat out angry, but why is this person doing this? Yeah, and we're so irritated that, that we had one little interaction with somebody that lasted for like three seconds, and we walk away, and for the next three hours, we're going over that situation. And I did this, and they did that. Why did they, they do that? What's going on with them? Don't they know? Blah, blah, hoo, hoo. Ah, oh, this is, you know, they always do that. Next time this happens, what am I going to do? Forget next time. I'm going to go back and talk about them, talk about it with them right now, because this is always happening, you know, and I really can't stand it. Don't they know that when they're using a, a tissue and a little scrap, of the tissue falls off onto the floor, don't they know that they should pick it up and put it in the trash can instead of leaving that little, little, you know, the little scrap on the floor? Yeah? What do they think? I, I'm, I'm the person who's going to pick it up? Yeah, they're waiting for somebody else to vacuum. They can't pick it up themselves. Yeah, their mother's Fathers didn't teach them to do small things like that for three hours. We are going round and around, you know, about the great suffering we experienced because somebody didn't pick up a corner of the tissue that fell on the floor. Yeah. Or you go into the bathroom. Yeah. And there's water all over the, the sink. And there's a rag that says, use this to clean the water. And people didn't. They just put, they had a water fight. And there's water all over the place in the bathroom. And there's even a rag that for there to clean it up, and they didn't. How discourteous. Oh, my goodness. Where did, how are people like that wanting to become ordained? You know, <laughs> when, they, when they can't even have the slightest bit of courtesy to clean the counter. Or, you know, that rag to wipe off the counter is filthy. Who put it there? Don't they know if somebody, you know, I splashed water, I want to clean the counter, but that rag is filthy. And it's just, it's not even folded up. It's just laid over something that actually is, it's supposed to put, you're supposed to, it's a cup holder. And, and you have this filthy little rag over it. And they expect me to go, <laughs> And wipe out the water. Because <laughs> then I just need to wash my hands. <laughs> oh, oh, 
Okay. What do those people want? You know? Yeah. And so you can go on with that. That it Yeah. For hour after hour, you know, I think we need to have a meeting. <laughs> yeah. Better yet, we need to have a rota. <laughs> we need a rota for at nine o'clock who goes in the bathroom and wipes the counter because we can't get individuals to do it. So now we need a rota. Then at 10 o'clock, who goes in and wipes the counter? 11 o'clock, who goes in and wipes Yeah. Who, who's going to do the uh, rota? Oh, thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Okay, so do you have little things that irritate you every day? Yeah. <laughs> but because of conceiving I, those little things become big things, don't they? Really? I mean, they expect me to wipe up their water with this filthy rag. We're in a monastery where people are supposed to be thinking of others. I don't know. Yeah. I know. We need a precept about it. <laughs> if the Buddha were here, he would make a precept that you take, you know, that filthy rag that isn't even folded properly and you must clean the counter with it. Immediately. Okay. So what category is it going to go in? Uh, <laughs> oh, so now we have another parajika. Oh, dear. This is serious business. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> but it, it's true, isn't it? Just by conceiving I, then everything becomes so important. Yeah. When you go to the doctor, do you ever think of the person who saw the doctor before you or the person who's waiting to see the doctor after you? Yeah, you do? Or are you just like... <laughs> Why are you taking so long? Yeah. Don't you know who we are? We want to come in, and we're special. Yeah. Okay. So that's 92. 93. Likewise, the misery of others does not befall me. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Finally, he said something I like. <laughs> Okay, likewise, the misery of others does not fall me. Nevertheless, by conceiving of others as I, their suffering becomes mine. Therefore, it too should be hard to bear. Okay, so here we're getting into the part of exchanging, yeah? So others' suffering doesn't, doesn't hurt me, okay? So then, you know, by the same logic as we uh, we used before, oh, my suffering doesn't help others, so they don't, they're not going to come help me. So their suffering doesn't harm me, so I don't need to go help them. But Chandi Deva is saying, mm -mm, you can't think like that. Because, okay, from others' point of view, they conceive an I. And... What we're doing now is practicing exchanging I for others, so that when we say I, it means others, okay? So if I, you know, if you're the one who stepped on the rusty nail, yeah, and I think of you as I, it's, it's what they call putting yourself in somebody else's shoes with assuming the, the, the word, you know? Too. So instead, oh, I'm putting myself in your shoes, it's I'm standing in my shoes, which used to be your shoes, but now they're mine. So now I, you know, 
I feel as you would feel because I know how it feels to be harmed. And so it doesn't matter who's getting harmed in here because, you know, if I label I on you and I say I want to be happy and free of suffering, then I should go and do that for you because you are me or I am you. Okay, it gets tangled up when you use the words, but I think if you get the meaning, you know, you just put yourself in somebody else's shoes, and it's like, oh, if, you know, we always say, if I were this person, this is how I would feel. But here we're saying, I am this person, now I know how they feel. And suffering is suffering. It doesn't matter whose it is. Yeah. So especially if we're thinking of ourselves as all parts of the big category of sentient life, then if any part of sentient life is in suffering, I should help because I am you. So yeah, you should help me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So if, if we have that, then he, he says, uh, you know, other, their suffering becomes mine. Therefore, it too should be hard to bear. Okay. Now here, when it talks about not being able to bear others' suffering, yeah, what it means is, okay, the same, uh, feeling of distaste I have for my own suffering, I have for others' suffering. Okay. I don't discriminate between theirs and mine. And suffering is suffering. So I should do something about it, no matter whose it is. Okay. What we think of, yeah, when we hear others' suffering is hard to bear. Okay. Then you, we usually think of somebody who is very attached to somebody else. The, the somebody else is suffering. And now the person with the attachment is just out of control with grief. Okay. So when we hear finding others suffering unbearable, we think, Oh no. That means I'm just going to be sobbing and hysterical and in so much pain and feeling so frustrated and have so much grief and feel, you know, I want to help this person and I can't and they're suffering and I can't bear to see them suffering. That makes me suffer because I'm worried about what's going to happen to them. I'm anxious. I'm fearful. But I, so I want to do something to help them. Yeah. yeah, nice, peaceful, clear-thinking mind. Huh? <laughs> so that's what we usually think seeing others suffering as our own entails. Yeah, that that's how we feel and we act like that. Yeah, when we're out of control or, you know, in the dumps with, with anger and frustration and fear and grief. Yeah, who's the star of the show? Whose happiness are we really concerned with? Yeah? I can't stand to see them suffer, so I want to get rid of my suffering. Because watching them suffer or even thinking of them suffering is too scary for me. Yeah. So in verse 93 is not talking about that's how we should react to other people's suffering. Because if we are anxious and hysterical and, you know, <laughs> what can we do to help? Yeah, we're, we're too overpowered by our own emotions to do anything to help. Yeah, so taking 
you know, caring about others' suffering as if it were our own doesn't mean getting like that. Yeah. It means having a clear thinking mind that can look at the situation and see what to do that would be of benefit according to our own abilities, according to what the, we think the other person needs. Yeah, there may be, I'm standing there with somebody else. They may have one skill to help that person. I may have another skill to help that person. I don't need to beat myself up, you know, because I can't do what they're doing to help. I just do what I know how to do to help, you know. But the wish to there is there. The compassion is there. Yeah. And so it's a clear thinking mind that can actually, you know, have a good effect on somebody. Like that man in the subway station. He just jumped off. He left his own child there. Jumped off and lay down on top of somebody, you know. He didn't go, oh, look at that. He wouldn't be like me, you know. Oh, no, somebody's on the track. This is terrible. I don't want him to get hurt. Please, you go get him <laughs> off. Yeah? Cause I don't know. I don't know what to do. I, 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 I'm incapable. I'm not weak enough. I can't pull him off, you know. I, I'm not even going to think of lying on top of him. You know, that's against my vows if I do that, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right, you know. <laughs> yeah, better, better let that person get run over by the, by the subway car than, you know, touch him. That would be really terrible. So, um, yeah, so to really think, you know, what what does it mean? And and how can I help and what will I do? One friend told me this story. She was in um she was in Fremont in Seattle and some of somebody rear ended her. Okay? And it was some young guy. Yeah. So it was some young guy who 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 did it. And he, of course, was like terrified because he was young. And, you know, when you're young and you haven't had your license very long and you get in an accident, you know, this is trouble. So she got out of the car, you know, to go back and, and talk to him. And she said, um, how about if we pray together? I would wait for the police to come. Let's pray together. And so they, they sat there by her damaged car and and prayed together. I thought, wow, that was, that's very creative. That is something that really, I'm sure, that helped the young fellow calm him down and make him see that, you know, not the whole world isn't angry with him and he's not going to be sued for every penny he has. And, you know, she just gave some kindness. So, uh, you know, to really think in different situations, what, what we can contribute. Okay. So, 94. Hence, so now the conclusion. Hence, I should dispel the misery of others because it is suffering just like my own. Okay, now, just look at that. What's your mind saying in response? Yeah, our virtuous mind. Yes, it's true. Yeah, their suffering is just like my own. I should dis dispel it. I want to be able to help sentient beings and contribute something to the world. I really sincerely do. But, <laughs> yeah, their suffering, you know, they brought on their own suffering. So why should I dispel it? 
I mean, some somebody is is a, a, you know, they're they're taking drugs, and I'm supposed to dispel their suffering. They are the ones who are making that choice to do that. You know, why am I getting dragged into it? That is their problem. Okay. Hence, I should dispel the misery of others. But it's my brother. It's my sister. I don't like seeing them being all strung out. Because it's suffering just like my own. Yeah, but they did it to themselves. Yeah. And anyway, I've tried before many times to get them to rehab, and they just won't go. I, I hear this a lot. So... Uh, what is it? You know, you've tried to get your sibling to rehab. They won't go. You're frustrated and happy. What do you do? You find the nearest Buddhist nun and ask them what to do. <laughs> yeah, like I'm supposed to know. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, well, you've tried to get them to rehab. They don't want to go. Okay. Uh, how about just trying to keep the door open with them? Maybe that's all you can do. And then I tell them the story of, uh, well, I have a few stories about this, but one about one of the, uh, one of the inmates who told me, um, that you have to really hit bottom before you want to get off drugs. And be, if you don't hit bottom, then even the judge sends you to do a drug detox program. You go, because you have to, the court mandated it. But afterwards, I finished my last session, good, let's go to the street and buy some dope. Yeah, so he said, he told me, you really have to hit bottom and and then see that you're the one who has to change. Yeah, and uh, and so the person who asked me about their brother, sister, whoever is is on drugs, I tell them that story, and I said, you know, maybe you can't do anything right now at this moment because you've tried those other things. The other person isn't receptive, but keep the door open so that sometime if they do hit bottom they'll know that they can come to you for help. If you just ostracize them now and say, you know, I've been trying to help you and you're coming to me asking for more money now and I know you're just going to go out and buy some more dope. So get lost. Leave me alone. I don't want to see you again. Yeah. If you say that, yeah, some people go, well, I'm speaking truthfully. Finally, I'm stopping trying to be a people pleaser and I'm speaking truthfully. I'm just telling them to get lost. Nagarja, Nagarjuna said that it's only truth if it's also kind. That really hit me. You know, just stay, saying what is factually true is not actually truth. It has to be kind as well yeah and so saying to your relative you know sorry right now i you know i'm not going to give you the money for that yeah it's a situation where you have to look at your life and see what you want to do and you know and just know I care about you and I'll support you. Yeah. But I won't support your drug habit. Yeah. And then you just leave it. And you're friendly and you're nice. They ask you for more money. No. Okay. But they know that you care about them. So sometime or another when they really hit bottom, they know that they can go and talk to you. Yeah, so keeping that door open is important. 
And sometimes it's like that seems to be all you can do. Yeah, these are difficult situations, yeah. They're really hard. Okay, so hence I should dispel the misery of others because it is suffering just like my own. But they don't want me to dispel. Uh, they they think their their suffering is that they they need another, uh, you know, shot of whatever it is, and I think their suffering is that they need another shot, you know. Or they, I didn't say it right. They they think their suffering is not getting the shot that they need. And I think their suffering is wanting that shot to start with. Okay. And that, yeah, what can I do? We don't, we're not seeing it the right way. Keep the door open. Let them know I care about them. Yeah. But giving them more money right now to go out and, and spend, that's not helping them. But people with substance abuse problems are very good at making other people feel guilty. Actually, it's not just them. Most of us have perfected the talent of making other people feel guilty for not giving us what we want. Yeah. You ate the last sweet potato. Yeah. Don't you realize that, you know, I don't eat the beans and I don't eat the rice and I don't eat this and I don't eat that and I, the other thing I don't eat, the only thing I eat is sweet potatoes and you just ate the last one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're my Dharma buddy. Don't you care about me starving to death? Yeah. How are we when people try and make us feel guilty? Do we fall for it? Yeah, you fall it, fall for it. Yeah. People pleasers anonymous. Not they're not anonymous. <laughs> people people pleasers public, you know. <laughs> who who is gonna fall for somebody making you feel guilty? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. If you had a Jew Jewish mother, <laughs> do Chinese mothers too? <laughs> yeah. They just need to look at you and you will feel guilty. <laughs> yeah. So knowing that doing something out of guilt isn't necessarily something that's going to help the other person. Yeah, it may just perpetuate the damage. But it's very often hard to say no. Okay, so we only got halfway through that verse, but um, maybe you have some questions or comments or whatever. We'll do the last two lines of the verse next time. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could speak just a little bit, because I think it's come up again lately. There's also the idea that I know what that person needs, and so helping them becomes my mission when I actually don't. <laughs> Of, no, that's not true. I do know what they need. Yeah, absolutely, I know what they need. And it is my mission, because I am a bodhisattva wannabe. Plus, I am a people pleaser, and I want everybody to love me. So I've got to save them. <laughs> yeah, Jesus couldn't do it, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah? There's a little bit of eye grasping in that, don't you think? Yeah? I'm going to save them. Because I really know what they need. 
and they're so foolish they don't know what they need. So they should listen to me. And if they aren't listening, I will say it again and again and again, and I will scream it to them so that out of terror they will accept it. Or I will make them feel guilty, you know, so that they will accept it, because I know what's best for them. Not only I know, but what you said, it's my mission in life to control them and make that happen. Yeah. So this is part of a control freak's recipe. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. You're kind of people pleaser, control freak. Those two go together, don't they? Yeah. They go together. Yeah. You want to please them by doing what you think they need. So you got to control them so you can give them what you think they need, and they'll be happy with you. Because <laughs> yeah. if I don't save them, and they just, I just let them keep doing what they're going to do, well, you know, the whole world's going to fall apart. It's not just that person who's going to fall apart, but they're going to influence so and 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 so. And there's, then there's just going to be havoc in the world. Yeah. So I better step in. <laughs> the superwoman, you know. What did, what did he used to say when he went in the telephone booth? No, it's not a bird. It's not a plane. It's Superman. So I'm going to be Superman. Yeah with a big S, standing for Sangha. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. Sangha, Savior. Hmm? What? Yes, definitely Messiah comes. Please pick up, put on your underwear on the outside. She'll tell me, stop putting on your underwear on the outside. Like Superman. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I went on a trip. She'll tell me, enough of that. Oh, that just means stop what you're doing? Stop trying to save everyone. Oh. Wearing your underpants outside. Where are your underwear? Yes, it's going to be the way to save people. That's what Superman, that's what his costume is. His costume is that. His underwear is outside. His leotards. Oh, I thought he just ran in the telephone booth and changed clothes. No. Oh, he was... He was... Okay, so you're going to do a demonstration? <laughs> no, I have to know what to do next time. What you do bugs me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> This really ties into the whole idea uh, about the person, you know, these personalities. The BBC that you were doing yesterday, we, we give ourselves these labels, inherently existent, senior, wise person, bodhisattva in training, sangha, and then it, the mission becomes justified <laughs> because mm -hmm. of the, the identities that we place on ourselves to what that purpose that we impute on that label. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. this is in all sorts of trouble. Yeah, why I'm the one who knows best. Yeah. Uh, something that's really stuck with me, going back to what you were talking about near the beginning of the how we would respond with shooting uh, in an active shooter situation and the effect that chanting might have. Uh, when I was in Atlanta, we went into lockdown because there was an active shooter at a nearby ele elementary school, I believe. Um, 
and no one was hurt because the the school was set up that you had to go through the front office to go in. And so one of the front office workers spoke to the shooter and talked to him as a human being and asked him how, you know, and, and I don't remember now the details of, you know, just how are you doing and what are you going through? And, you know, the front office workers at elementary schools are their own sort of superheroes. And no one was harmed for that day. Mm. He didn't shoot anybody? Nope. Huh? No one got shot. It That was kind of how far it, it went. Wow. Was She was able to basically talk him down. Yeah. Yeah. That's what NVC yeah, shows some understanding. And it really changes the other person. Anything else? Okay, and let's dedicate.